Go ahead. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining along uh, with our uh, presentation here this morning. Um, I'm Blair Baylock here, joined with Rick Mitzel um, of Mustard 21. Uh, we're here to talk to you about mustard uh, variety and agronomy tips and tricks for anyone new or um, looking to ex uh, help out their growing conditions going forward. So um, I'll start off with a little bit of a presentation on net returns, uh, um, seed treatments that we can provide, uh, bag size. Um, I'll also have buyers at the very end there, just some of them included. And then Rick will kind of touch base on varieties and agronomy tips, tips and tricks. So, all right. So here's a, a general lookout for um, the net returns for dry land here. Um, numbers are uh, just rough right now. It's, it, it obviously can vary area to area, but um, Greg would had the opportunity to make these for me just to have an idea of what you could look into for um, what you could get for returns for your mustard. Uh, so we kind of just use the general um, mustard there comparative. I know um, yellow compared to brown and oriental have a little bit different pricing on them, but um, just to give you guys an idea. And then we also have net returns on irrigation. So um, this is all based on a, against a wheat. So it's looked pretty good overall. I mean, the irrigated um, yellow would, would be relatively, it, it, I think he's basing it off of the hybrid yellow and the hybrid brown there. So seed treatments that we can provide on our seed. Um, I guess from the different varieties that we have, like we have the hybrid yellow 80, AAC brown 18, um, and Dante yellow, uh, Centennial brown, and the three orientals, um, which are Cutlass, Forge, and Vulcan. Um, they, we can uh, have Helix Vibrance on there. And if you need a little bit extra uh, flea beetle protection, then we include Hortensia Advance. Um, bag sizes, um, this is typically what we order in. Um, kind of, we round it to the nearest 50 pound bag at the very end for depending on what your seeding rate's like. Um, and this, yeah, this is just to give you an idea of um, uh, what buyers are out there. There's more out there. Um, and if you're looking for contacts, just uh, reach out to me and I can get you in contact with them. But, um, and then throughout this presentation, if you have any questions, just uh, you can put it in the chat and I can um, read it out or you can just uh, comment out, uh, and we'll answer to the best of our, of our, of our abilities. So Rick, um, if you are ready to take over there. Sure. Yep. Yeah. I'll just, I'll, I'll, I just, I didn't think I'd do a slide presentation. No, no. Do it more of as a discussion. So if you want to pop your questions uh, online or, or ask me straight out front, that's fine as well. So I'll give you a bit of a back, bit of background here. Um, I'm with Muster 21. I'm the CEO of Muster 21. Muster 21 was developed uh, about 12 years ago. It was set up to be the research uh, side of uh, Sask Mustard. Sask Mustard was doing a lot of work on uh, developing new uses for for mustard because we all know that if if we get too many acres and and price gets affected, so we're always we're always looking at at new uses. So when M21 was established, that was the sole use was to, uh, to, to work on the, the research side. So what we've done uh, since then is we've, um, we've uh, branched off into the seed business. So we've started uh, developing our own seed variety. So we work with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Um, Bifang Chang, Dr. Bifang Chang out of Saskatoon is our, our plant breeder. 
and she develops the varieties and then Muster 21 uh, has the marketing rights to uh, any of the new varieties that she comes up with. So about four years ago, um, she came up with a hybrid uh, brown mustard. Uh, that was the first hybrid mustard in the world and still is. It's, um, it's a high yielder. It's the whole transition to uh, um, hybrids from uh, open pollinated and mustard is going down about the same path that uh, the canola did. So we look at it today, uh, we're looking at about a 20% yield increase to go from uh, a, a product like Centennial, Centennial Brown to Hybrid Brown 18. That's uh, pretty significant. And that was kind of the same path that we went through with canola years ago. So we're seeing some really nice uptake now because of that increase in, in yields. And that's pretty consistent. I, I can say pretty confidently you're gonna see that. I had a farmer Last year at uh, Gravelberg, Saskatchewan, he split a field between brown eight, a hybrid brown 18 and centennial brown. And he actually ended up with about 25% more on the hybrid side. So when we, when we do our, um, our yield estimates like that, they're very, uh, they're very conservative. So that's what you're going to see on that. Uh, so on the yellow side, um, Beefang wanted to help us out on that side as well. So what she did was she took the, uh, uh, she took the yellow and and we're, we're trying to work we're trying to get a pure hybrid in yellow it's really hard to do um uh, yellow mustard is a completely different species than brown mustard and so it's uh it it needs a lot more time and effort to do that so what she's done in the meantime though she's come up with what we call a composite variety so the um AAC yellow 80 is our our yellow 80 that we is our yellow variety that we use for uh, for the high yielders now so it's looking at about a 10% yield increase from uh, a product like Andante. So she she spent a quite a bit of time on that. And probably of, of the varieties, I get more comments back to me on yellow 80 even than the hybrid way. And I get lots of calls on the hybrid, but the yellow 80 has really, really gone over well. Um, it's really taken off and our seed sales have, have really uh, jumped from on it as well. So both of those uh, varieties are ours. We don't we don't have any of the marketing rights or anything to any uh, of the varieties like uh, Brown 18 or uh, Andante or <clears throat> Centennial Brown. That's all. That all goes to the Canadian Mustard Association. So the only two varieties we have right now are those. We're working on a replacement for Hybrid Brown 18, um, and it's called Hybrid Brown uh, AAC Hybrid Brown Elite, and so it'll it'll replace Hybrid Brown 18. Uh, it was looking really good in the trials last year. We haven't got the full registration yet, so we haven't put anything out in print or, or pricing or anything on it yet. So we're still waiting for the registration on it. That should come in the next probably 60 days. So it's uh, it's going to be about um, 3 to 4% higher yielding than Brown 18. I saw it last summer at the uh, Swift Current uh, Research Farm, and it looked really good. Um, the unfortunate part was uh, two days later it got hailed out. So... Uh, but at least we got to see it before it was uh, before it was hailed out. So maybe I'll just stop there, Blair, and see if anybody's got any questions so far. Okay. Yeah, it seems going. seems you've answered uh, all them all right now. So, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, um, going forward, then uh, we're uh, we're looking at developing uh, more varieties. But I, I think right now we're kind of with the the brown elite. That'll be uh, that'll be our newest variety for a while, and the yellow eighty probably uh, same thing there. We've we've tried to put yellow eighty into the field and and compare it to uh, other new options, and it it never comes out. Uh, a loser it's always our highest yielder so we're, we'll probably have it for a few years anyway in terms of agronomy um i get a lot of calls people call me and say like what should i put down for fertility and so <clears throat> i tell them um if you're if you're if we do actually get back to normal uh, rainfall or hopefully we do instead of these droughts we've been having um if you put the fertility with it it will respond for sure so with the two varieties that I was talking about, the hybrid brown 18 and the yellow 80. Sorry, I 
Yes, you message you about that, I think, or text oh, you. Yeah, maybe? I got a little tacky step. Yeah. Well, on that house. Or you on the phone, sorry. <laughs> so what what I say then on the fertility is I tell people to to use what you're doing with canola. If it's 100 pounds of actual land or 110, that's uh, that's what I would use with, with these two new varieties too, because if you do get the moisture, they will perform. Had a, um, we did a trial out at uh, Outlook uh, two summers ago. Not, not, well, not two summers, but not this past summer, the summer before. And we put uh, Hybrid Brown 18, Yellow 80, and uh, Liberty Link 233P for the pod chatter. We put them out there and the brown and the uh, hybrid brown 18 and the liberty link both yielded in in the low 60s and the yellow was in the about low 50s about 54. so it just goes to show that it it will definitely um it will perform if it if it has the moisture and it has the fertility um a grower at um uh, cabri this summer that had uh, hybrid brown 18 under irrigation and at the end of the day, when he harvested it, he got 47 bushels an acre. And uh, he was extremely happy with that. Can you do a split uh, application to end? So if it's dry in the spring, go with liquid uh, partway through, does it respond to that or is that too risky? Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's similar to canola that way. We do have some people that, you know, they'll put fertility down um, to see what, and then see what happens with the moisture and, and put, um, uh, come in and spray fertility on afterwards. And yeah, that, that works as well. Okay. Yeah. I got a question in the chat. Are flea beetles as much of a problem in mustard as canola, specifically yellows? <laughs> yeah, you know, they're at one point in time, um, when there was probably 10 million acres of canola in Western Canada, um, the flea beetles didn't really bother the mustard so much. They, they were, I don't think they were nuts about it, but in the last few years now, we're seeing the damage on yellow and mustard, uh, yellow and brown mustard is as significant as it is in canola. So um, it definitely, I would say if you're growing them, keep an eye on the flea beetles and make sure when you start to see damage that you spray them. But even though mustard tastes uh, not so good to them, they still like the uh, green plant matter. <coughs> so we're, um, I've explained this to Blair, we're working with um, Bayer right now to add uh, mustard to the Bateo label. And so we are probably gonna have that for the spring of 2025. Uh, it takes uh, 18 months. I started dealing with uh, Bayer in December of 2022. Uh, to get that uh, crop added to their label. In the past, uh, when PRA years ago, it was so mustard and canola were kind of interchangeable on these types of labels, but uh, they won't do that anymore. They want to see the full registration package. So Bayer was uh, was nice enough to come to us and say, uh, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll support you on that. So they're, they're actually uh, supporting us on the trials and everything. So we're moving forward. So we'll hope, hopefully we'll have that for, uh, for uh, 20, spring of 2025. Now, flea beetles can cause a lot of damage and you really do have to keep an eye on them to make sure that they're, uh, you're keeping them at bay. Have you seen as big of an issue with uh, like other insects like Ligus or um, like, I know um, yellows are naturally resistant to cabbage seed pod weevils, right? But it's, um, but yeah, like Ligus late season, is that an issue or? We haven't seen much of that at all, actually. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, one, one of the benefits of growing mustard is you don't end up spraying for a lot of those types of insects. They, they don't seem to bother mustard as much. Uh, now, if, if we start growing mustard in some of the real heavy, uh, canola areas we might see some some issues in the future but so far we haven't seen anything okay what sort of chem are you, you seeing guys using Saskatchewan for in crop and that like is there is there other options is there because I know here there's not many options itself but the, we us ourselves we typically just um, front load it with edge and, and authority even just to give it a head start but 
Is there any other options that we might not know about? Well, um, that's what a lot of people are doing. They're using authority and edge. Um, so the edge they're putting down in the fall and the authority in the spring. Yeah. You have to go with the uh, low rate on the authority, the 88 gram rate. And that's uh, that's just because if you put too high a rate on there, you could end up with uh, with uh, some issues in terms of uh, if, you, if you get a high uh, concentration of water at, at a, in a short time frame, that can uh, that can wash the authority down into the root zones and make the uh, mustard sick for a while. So that's why they've only got mustard on their low rate. So uh, you have to be cognizant of that. I, now I have had some farmers tell me that they uh, they put up a they put a higher rate on. They do it in the fall, but that's you know that's them doing things on their own. We certainly can't recommend that. But so what what I tell most guys is you can get you can cover off your weed issues pretty good with. Um, with it in uh, edge in the fall and your authority in the spring. The other thing to remember too is uh, this this mustard is really aggressive and you will find that you'll have ground cover uh, fairly quickly, like from planting to full flower is about 45 days. Okay. So you'll, you'll be at full flower in 45 days. So the time frame in between there is pretty significant. You can, uh, you can see ground cover within probably 15, 20 days for sure. So good, pretty good competition then. Yeah, so it really works good at, at uh, com out competing the weeds for sure. Does a okay. really good job. And uh, we had it at, um, we had both the varieties at the uh, Egg and Motion show last year. And uh, you could definitely see the effects of the authority uh, on the on the kosher. It does a really nice job on kosher. Yeah, yeah it does. Um, Have you been Oh, go on. Sorry, Blair. Have you guys done much authority in the fall? Like, even with our warm weathers and Chinooks here, do you, do you think you're going to see some activity on the authority through the winter? I, I don't know. I haven't seen enough of it. I couldn't tell you. I'd say that's probably a better question for the uh, authority rep. How about you, Blair? Um, Yeah, for, I guess, where we put, like, it. I'd have to talk to the team more, but I believe we we for sure only go with edge in the fall and then kind of front load it with authority in the spring. So it like I guess for myself, I can't speak with experience on whether you'd see a lot of action with it in the fall, but um with how extended things are, you probably could. Yeah, I know they they really try to promote more fall application and some of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, it just makes me all nervous with the climate change that we are not the climate, the weather change we get. Yeah. In February, if we get that plus 10, 12 with some mm -hmm. rain, is it going to activate it and start it? We're going to lose some activity. There's a chance, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm worried about too. Yeah, yeah. So, no, we had a comment in the chat there. Club root an issue with mustard as of yet? We haven't run into club root yet. Uh, we're very cognizant of club root. So we've actually started a uh, we've started breeding for club root now. So we've uh, we've started the process. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, um, but there are different types of uh, germplasms that we can get uh, to help us with club root. So it's on our priority list right now. It would be affected by club root for sure. Yeah, but uh, we just haven't had uh, uh, we just we haven't had it in that pure mustard growing area we haven't run into uh to club root yet are you seeing it in canola in in your area at all uh, blair no um i mean depending on the area right it's i know it's starting to creep down a little further south but the areas that it could be in aren't generally mustard areas so um i I'd, I'd say as of right now in the south we're pretty safe but it's um i know it's going to be more and more of a thing going forward it's just have to be wary of it but yeah 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 we're, we're susceptible to it for sure and mm -hmm. uh so we're, we're we're working on the uh, breeding side of it to uh to, to start to develop club, club root resistant varieties yeah yeah okay we're, we've started down the process so we're probably almost two years into it. Okay. Have another comment in the chat here. 
with the new varieties that you're saying fill in that you're saying fill in rapidly, can you overseed and choke the crop like you see in high plant populations in canola? Is the high rate of 12 pounds too much with a distril and higher seed survivability? Well, what what a lot of people are doing is um, they're seeding on the brown, hybrid brown 18, they're seeding somewhere between four and a half and six pounds per acre. So that's um, that's pretty standard. There's uh, there's uh, probably the average is is five. There's a lot of guys going five, and you don't don't need to get higher than that. It's um, you're going to see significant ground cover uh, even at four and a half pounds, for example. Now we say you go to five. You know, it's a little drier soils, and you're not going to get as much germination. Uh, so that's what we tell guys. Under irrigation, guys are going four and a half just because uh, obviously they're putting it into moisture and keep feeding it moisture. So you'll get you're going to get that um, that aggressive growth regardless of the seeding rate. But again, you want to make sure that you adjust your seeding rate based to uh, soil uh, soil water composite. Okay, and then with the yellow, um, like depending on soil types and all that between the 10 to 12 pounds, still a good option or like, yeah, yeah. We recommend 10 right now. Okay. Yeah. We're doing some seeding. We're doing some seeding rate trials. Um, we did them with Brown 18 when it came out because we weren't sure what the, what to recommend for uh, seeding rates. We're doing <laughs> yeah. the same thing with yellow 80. Okay. So we started them last summer. Uh, it's a three year program and we're going to do them again this summer and next summer. And then we'll have a recommendation. We're hoping to, uh, to be able to pull it down to uh, with the yellow 80 with a, with its aggressive nature as well. We're hoping to be able to pull it down to nine pounds, but we, we won't know that for, uh, for a couple of years yet. So right now we're, we're recommending 10. Perfect. And I think, I think that's what most guys will tend to go at regardless, but it's a good question just for the sake of, I know with the, the lack of, or not many chem options in you kind of want to see the little heavier just for the sake of it right just to get that over competition but well you'll you'll find uh, if if you grow if you take a look at uh, um, wheatland conservation's website in out of out of swift current they've got every year brian takes a picture of uh from a drone of the of the field of all of his plots and you can pick out the yellow 80 and the brown 18 every year because they're they're come in at a very early age they're completely brown or completely green and you'll see brown in the you know you can see through to the ground on centennial brown or in dante but on yellow 80 and, and brown 18 you won't see that you'll see the ground cover comes really quick once the once the uh, varieties get to about that two leaf stage and they start to develop their secondary roots then they really take off then they really you're you're going to see a lot of really aggressive growth okay much more so than you'll see with Andante and and uh, Centennial Brown. If you put them side by side and you go out at that three to four leaf stage, you'll you'll be shocked at the difference. And we can we can work with uh, different bag size, like uh, Blair had mentioned. Yeah. Uh, we can help accommodate on that as well. Okay. And I think going forward, it's um, certainly mustard's going down that canola path. I think we want to start um, <clears throat> on the process of where we're booking early as well. We um, we do do our seed, a good chunk of our seed production in North America, but we're also doing some in Chile as well. So as we, as we move forward, the, better indications people like Greg and Blair have from the, their customers as to what they're thinking for the next year, the better off we are for sure, because then we can, uh, we can make sure we get enough seed in the ground. We've, uh, we grew all the uh, yellow 80 this summer in, in Alberta. So it's, it's all, uh, it's all ready to go. Now we grew some the uh, hybrid Brown 18. We grew in uh, Montana and, uh, we have uh, coming up a little bit short there, so we're we're going to make up for that production with stuff out of Chile. But going forward, any any indication we can get from the customer and from people like Greg and Blair as to what uh, 
what the interest level is and what uh, what kind of seed supply they're going to need that that helps us a lot in terms of uh, of getting that the, as we move forward like if you take a look at it i, I ran the numbers the other day we're probably running 25 percent of the uh, brown acres now in western canada or hybrid hybrid brown 18 and so that's in three years and, and i just see that continuing to grow i, I don't think that's going to slow down at all i think we're going to see uh I, I can see us at 50% of the of the market will be hybrids in two years. Yeah. Are buyers becoming more familiar with uh, the hybrids? Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, we we haven't had any issues at all with the yellow 80. It's been very well accepted. Yeah. Uh, Brown 18 too has. We had an issue with the, a um, processor in um, France that had some issues with uh, the Brown 18. So you do hear some rumblings about that. But um, so we're moving to the, the new variety, the Brown Elite. And we did the testing this past week on it. And it, it came in uh, pretty much identical to Centennial Brown, which is where we want to be. Because Centennial Brown is obviously a product that um, people that are, that are doing wet or dry milling have been utilizing for 20, 25 years. And they're familiar with it. And they, they don't really want to change their process. So uh, when hybrid brown 18 came out, it had a little different profile than what uh, Centennial Brown had. But now we've gone to, uh, for in terms of milling characteristics, we've gone to more back to the Centennial Brown um, characteristics with with uh, hybrid brown elite. And I think as we move forward, uh, you know, one of the things to watch out for is the uh, European market is they're not ever going to accept GMOs. So the one thing that we do do with uh, with our varieties is we make sure that we've got um, uh, we give you a certificate for zero GMO in the seed, so the purity is is good. Uh, we really don't want anybody starting the whole process with GMO in the seed, and so we uh, we go to zero. I know that um, Clearfield Canola, for example, like they allow up to 0.25% uh, contamination in the seed, but um, so far we've stuck to zero with with the uh, uh, with the with the brown and the and the yellow AC brown eighteen and yellow eighty, and I think the day is going to come where they're going to ask for for purity tests and and they're going to want us to prove in the seed that we don't have any uh, GMOs and that's kind of why we're doing it right now. So I guess a word of caution if you're if you're buying seed um, uh, from uh, neighbors or whatever you're doing just just be cognizant of the fact that there there could be some GMO contamination in there. Is it wise to seed? They're going to seed three quarters, I think, and I'm thinking two quarters of a Dante and one quarter of uh, yellow or uh, hybrid. Is there an issue at harvest time where they can contaminate each other, or just keep them separate? Um, no. If you're doing, if you're growing Dante and yellow eighty, you shouldn't yeah. have. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, just if like if we have three quarters together and we want to do it comparison i didn't know if there's varieties going to be bent separately or watch for anything special no i just talk to your buyer whoever it is you're buying from i don't think that they're going to ask you to segregate um, yellow 80 from uh from andante I, I i'd be surprised if they did but again i always say you know make sure you talk to your buyer on that just to make sure there there is no issues but i, I haven't heard of anybody doing that yet no okay I think you, if you're going to put them side by side, it'll, uh, you'll see a significant uh, difference when you hit that 22 to four leaf stage for sure. Okay. Straight cutting for either one, like yellows, the Dante and the, the yellow 80 is a straight cut. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Yellow mustard is, is really good. It's um, if you look at the scale of, you know everybody's familiar with pod shatter on canola if you look at the scale like when uh there was no pod shatter in canola and now there is pod shatter resistance in canola and i think in my mind anyway the pod shatter resistance is is excellent now i think in canola it gets really really good we're not yellow mustard isn't as good as the pure uh, pod shatter canolas but it's very close it would be like 90 percent of that Okay, how about desiccating or, or regrowth? Uh, unless you get um, 
unless you've had a dry year and you get rain in the fall, you might see a little bit of regrowth, but not very much uh, to desiccate it off. The only, I only know one guy that I talked to last summer and I probably talked to 200 guys in a year. I only talked yeah. to one guy last year that, that desiccated. It was a fellow that had a yellow 80 under irrigation last year. And he desiccated just to make sure that when it was time to harvest, he could just go right through and not worry about it. But normally I don't see desiccation happening. So again, just make sure you talk to your to your buyers. Keep open communication yep. with your buyers on on uh, on what you're looking at doing. I think that's the best way to do it. The uh, the demand for uh, mustard in the world has increased about twenty percent in the last five years. So we're enjoying some of that. We have a uh, uh, we have a preferred product in the marketplace. The uh, processors in places like France and Germany and stuff, they they like uh, Canadian mustard because it is a bigger seed size and it's a more consistent seed size. And so um, I think you know, I often get the question, well, is there is there room for more acres in, in mustard? People are worried about the price at the end of the day. Certainly it's like anything else. If we overproduce, we're going to, uh, we're going to hurt the price, but yeah, uh, from talking to the buyers this year, they said uh, we're so far behind on using up ending inventories on mustard that uh, we probably need 600,000 acres of mustard this year to uh, at normal precipitation, you know, to get back to the normal uh, production levels, just to kind of get us back in in uh, normal levels for uh, production for uh, carryover amounts. I'd assume uh, new crop prices will start to come out here relatively soon for most buyers, but um, just as a, once that kind of gets going, then um, in the meantime, yeah, if any question like seed pricing is available for uh, all our varieties, um, any questions on that, just give me a holler. Um, yeah, is there any other questions in the chats there? There's one. Oh yeah. I'm having trouble. Oh here, I got it now. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Uh I've grown canola for a number of years. I ran a four-year rotation canola wheat lentil. Good rotation canola. How much risk canola contamination? Uh that's a really good question. I get that one quite a bit as well. Um what we recommend is we recommend to have um minimum four years. Um, most likely five between canola and mustard. Just because canola can volunteer for so long and, and be so aggressive. So the new uh, hybrid varieties are, you know, they're really good and they're really strong. So they do, unfortunately, volunteer quite, quite, uh, quite well as well. I had a lot of guys tell me this past year that um, they were breaking alfalfa or they're breaking hayland. And uh, if you take a look back, Five years ago, we were 300,000 acres of mustard. This past year, we were probably 600 to 620, somewhere in that range. And I think a lot of that growth that we got was from guys breaking alfalfa, breaking hayland, and then uh, because of cattle prices, and then they were putting, uh, they wanted the highest return they could get, and they were putting um, uh, mustard in. I've done some work with the irrigation district out of uh, Outlook and same thing happened there. A lot of guys that were expanding their irrigation acres, uh, Saskatchewan provincial government uh, put some money towards expanding irrigation acres. So some of the guys that were putting in new uh, irrigation acres on hayland and stuff like that, they were also taking it out of uh, hayland production and putting it into mustard. So for, yeah, for the possibility of contamination, um, would you recommend just growing a yellow just so, so you have the possibility of color sorting at the very end or? 
Yeah, that that's that's definitely a um, an option, Blair, for sure. Because yeah, you have, with the brown, you you don't have, really have the ability to do that. So, but um, you uh, we, if you do end up with a bit of an issue and you have to color sort it, you can end up having to cut quite a bit out. You know, you could be you could be like a ten percent loss sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'd say you know we 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 recommend four to five years and uh, between if if you're running those you should be you should be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Other question is the losses of mustard with color sorting. Is it usable in the feed market or is it just garbage? Um, it, it all depends on 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 your uh, a buyer again. If your feed buyer is is willing to take it, uh, mustard doesn't. Um, you have to watch when you're feeding mustard because it, it has high level of glucosinolates and it it can cause some issues to the cattle. So you have to make sure that your buyer knows what he's doing. You have to have pretty low levels of mustard in there. So uh, if 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 a cattle producer is willing to take it, well then uh, then you've done well. But uh, you might end up uh, yeah you might end up scrapping it. I had over one percent contamination at four years on some new to me rented land. Yeah the. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm not sure what your buyers thought about that one percent. If if they were okay with that or not, because sometimes what they can do is take it and blend it off, and it's not an issue. But uh, yeah, if the problem, the whole problem is it doesn't take very very many volunteers of canola to cause you an issue with uh, GMO contamination, just because again it's so aggressive, <coughs> and you can end up with. Uh, contamination fairly quickly but i'm curious uh, did did your buyer take it at at 1% contamination i had a lot of uh acres of mustard so i was able to blend it out okay and they had uh, it couldn't go to germany it had to get sent to uh um, indonesia or some other country so yeah. Yeah, I might have went into the US. But it couldn't go to Germany for normally all my stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the the uh, problem with Germany though is there seems to be more uh mustard that's being bought in Canada now and shipped to Germany, but from Germany it goes to France and that's where you'd run into the issue. Okay, I got another question here. You mentioned yeah. the idea of edge in the fall and authority in the spring. Is that on irrigation, dry land, or both? Just curious if there is any potential for crop injury. Um, no, that's that would be for both uh, edge in the fall and uh, authority in the spring. And maybe Blair and Greg got more uh, more experience with this than I do. Uh, I would say that would have fit to both. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> the only time, like I say, the only time you get injury is when you get the equivalent of about two inches of rain in a really short time frame, like over 24 to 48 hours where it washes the uh, uh, authority into the root zone. Which I mean, depending on the area, um, we're not that, at that we're not at a high risk of it, sorry. So <laughs> especially this last couple of years, but yeah, no, it's definitely something to keep in mind, but overall we haven't seen any issues with it yet, so. Again, I really think uh, authority does a good job on kosher from what I've seen. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions at this given time, um, I guess we can wrap her up here. Uh, thanks, Rick, for uh, coming and joining us. And thanks, everyone, for joining on this 
mustard talk. Um, if you have any other questions after this, just send them to me. And then I, if it's a Rick question, I can uh, send it to him. We'll get the best answer possible for you. But other than that, I hope you guys have a great day and throw some mustard. <laughs> Thanks, Blair. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I know. I know.